A few months ago, I sat down to rewatch Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade. Widely believed to be one of the best in the franchise, I've always held it to a pretty high standard. This time around, though, I started to notice things that made me view the film in a completely different light. One that I had honestly never really considered or looked at before. Take this bridge, for example. To a normal person, it's just a bridge. To the cast and crew of the movie, it's just a bridge. But to me, it's not just any bridge. It's THE bridge. I'll be the first to admit that this isn't some groundbreaking discovery, but it is strangely fascinating to me that this unimportant background element became a centerpiece to the LEGO counterpart. The entire first room of this level is built upon raising this bridge, this bridge that's only in the movie for less than five seconds. Again, while this is such a minor case of similarities between the two, it would eventually be a spark that would light the flame that would result in me analyzing every shot, background element, and easter egg in all three films to find out if LEGO Indiana Jones is a faithful adaptation. Admittedly, this is a very silly and ridiculous question. It's a licensed kids game. It's not going to show a man being shot in the chest by Indiana Jones or a man being sacrificed to the Hindu god of doom, but that wasn't what I was interested in comparing. I wanted to see how Traveler's Tales adapted the screenplay of Indiana Jones into the levels of LEGO Indiana Jones. Obviously, cutscenes are cutscenes. They can be remade, tampered, and toyed with until they're absolutely perfect. But levels are much more interesting. I was genuinely shocked at how many background elements became focal points within the game, and how many fights and, and mechanics became mechanics in the game as well, and I think by the end of this video you will be too. So. To not delay any further, let's begin in the first Indiana Jones movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark. As a side note, uh, I wanted to dress up as Indiana Jones for this video, but I didn't really have the money to do so, so I figured that Indiana Jones would be cool with wearing this fish hat. Comment down below if you think Indiana Jones would be cool wearing this cool-ass fish hat. Raiders was the first Indiana Jones film I remember watching. I used to have this mini DVD player, I would sneak up to my room and I would watch the entirety of the movie almost every night for like a month straight. So it's also the one that I go back to the least as a result of that overexposure. But I can't deny that it is a great movie and probably still the best in the franchise. The first area of the Lost Temple is pretty standard. They kind of readapt the opening cutscene of the game into a playable segment with the pit, the blow darts, the Hovito statue, and all of it. It's more of an adaptation of itself than anything else. But the following room is a bit more interesting. Here we have to cross a small pond to the pier on the other side. There's alligators, a waterfall, and even a raft. I didn't remember anything even remotely close to this happening in the movie, probably because I was way too distracted by the greatest character introduction of all time. But right behind Indiana, after he whips the gun away from Baranka, we see that same waterfall. This waterfall in the background became the main point you walk through in the game. Not only that, but when Indiana enters the temple for the first time, we see him brush away a large portion of vines. And how do we enter the temple in the game? By pulling on two vines. It's at this point where our characters step into the spider-filled entrance for the first time, with the cobwebs and tarantulas to match. There are actually quite a few cobwebs in the LEGO variation as well, with them spawning red spiders when broken, and not to mention the giant brown spiders guarding the entrance of the temple itself. This temple is where we get three of the most iconic Indiana Jones scenes in the movie. First up, the spike trap. Indy warns Satipo to not step into the light, and when he puts his hand up, a bunch of spikes jump out from the wall. Admittedly, the spike trap is very loosely adapted here, and the giant hole in the ceiling of the temple has nothing to do with the trap itself, but the attention to detail is still kind of there. This is one of my favorite Indiana Jones moments in general, as it kind of shows that he's always one step ahead of his peers, especially that guy. Definitely that guy. Before we get to the idol and the pressure plate traps, there is still one more major scene we have to cover, and it's the whip gap. When Indy both enters and leaves the temple, he has to cross this gap that almost kills him twice, first time with the whip and second time with a vine. This doesn't appear in any capacity in the game. Instead, we only see a ladder and a bridge, both being brand new additions. The only other possible spot that I could see that references this moment is at the end of the level, but we'll touch on that in a second. The bridge brings us to the pressure plate puzzle, which is inverted from the film. Instead of having to dodge all the pressure plates on the floor, we now have to press specific ones. There is a neat, potentially accidental detail in the end of the puzzle. 
where the gap from the final plate to the door is one tile larger than any of the ones before it, which could be a potential reference to the fact that Indy has to do a little wall kick to avoid falling on a pressure plate in the movie. Again, this could be unintentional, but if not, it's a neat easter egg. This brings us to the idol room itself, where the floor puzzle is swapped out for floating platforms. I can't say I'm a huge fan of this change, but it is more interesting than just more pressure plates. It's also where the level takes a major deviation. After Indiana grabs the idol, he's supposed to run backwards through the temple. In the game, however, he takes an entirely new and different path, with the falling Havito heads referencing the heads that fall in the idol room. This is where I think the whip gap scene was intended to be adapted, but because in the film Indy has to use a root and not a vine, I think it's too much of a stretch to count, making the entire second half of the temple pretty unfaithful. There isn't much to talk about inside the boulder chase, they throw a few spike pits here and there to flesh out the platforming, but that's about it. Even the chase scene with the Hovitos is sort of half-baked, as most of it takes place in an open green field, which the game trades in for more of that same forest environment from earlier. Hell, even the whip that Indy uses to get into the plane doesn't appear until the cutscenes, despite the level's over-reliance on said vines. Level 1 started off great, giving us a variety of environments all based on the source material, but it quickly deviates in ways that leave out key details that, while not integral, were still events that are important to the franchise. Level 2 Into the Mountains is one of the more interesting ones we get to talk about, as it's not only almost entirely accurate, but the additions it makes to the corresponding segments of the film manage to be huge but at the same time insignificant. Marion's bar is almost perfectly recreated save for two details. The fireplace on the right wall in the game is on the front wall in the movie, and for some reason the devs added a piano that I couldn't find anywhere in the film. Besides those two grievances, it's great. There's this back staircase you only get to see once in this overhead shot, and these smaller areas with the crosshatch wood patterns are in the proper spot, with one even being important enough to give you a minikip. Though, once you leave the bar, the game loses itself. In the original movie, the bar burns down and then BAM, Indy and Marion are all the way in Cairo. The game takes you on a hike through the Nepal mountains, though, ending with Indy and Marion stealing an army truck and driving away. Not only does this make the standard console version of LEGO Indiana Jones increasingly inaccurate, but in turn it makes the handheld version, the game's sequel, and by technicality the game's speedrun, even more accurate, as the less time you spend here, the more time you get to spend in canon locations. Speaking of, it's time for City of Danger. I didn't have high hopes going into this level, as right away the opening cutscene breaks sequence from the movie showing that Indy and Marion haven't yet met Sala, rather, are going to meet him. In the film, the first scene in Cairo happens with Sala at his house. This happens a lot within levels in this game, along with something I like to call the two-player fallacy. Because these games are designed around cooperative play, Marion is playable throughout the whole level, but if the game was to be more accurate, the co-op partner would have switched to Sala around halfway through, yet another mistake that the second game corrects. There's a couple of market stands propped up around Cairo, most notably the one that sells apples paralleling the same one from the movie, but there's a major stand missing, the one where Marion grabs her frying pan from. Oh, and I'm assuming that this is supposed to be the cart that Indy initially pushes Marion into, so we'll put her right here for authenticity's sake. Doesn't she look so happy? After the alleyway, we reach the rooftop segment, a section of the level entirely made up just for the game, which doesn't give this level a whole lot of credence. But the final room more than makes up for that, with tons of little details that I'm glad made the final cut, such as the presence of bazooka and grenade troopers representing the car explosion that Indy thinks kills Marion, and even the wicker baskets that she hides in over in the back right corner. This does, again, break the sequencing of the level, as she should have already been in the baskets before this room, but it's such a minor gripe that I really don't think it takes away from much. It's interesting to me that if you cut these extra segments from the games, such as the rooftops or the Nepal mountains, that they would be near close to perfect recreations of sets from the film. It's even crazier to think that regardless, this game still remains the most accurate retelling of the movies in video game form. Every other indie game adapts their own story, or was made for the Atari, and shares little in common with the coinciding films besides the namesake. It does make you wonder if LEGO Indiana Jones 2's more condensed approach to level design was a direct response to the inaccuracies in this game. If you were to take Marion's bar from both games, for example, by technicality, the second would still be more accurate, 
as a result of all that fluff being gone, but that's not what I'm here to talk about today. Well of Souls is one of my favorite levels in the game. As a kid, I loved the feeling of exploration it gave, mostly due to the film scene all taking place in one room, but the game letting you explore all of Tannis. This again doesn't lend itself towards accuracy, but I think it's all the more better because of it, though this once again raises yet another continuity issue. In the movie, Indy and Sala find the Ark in a completely different location, and once they unearth it and drop down, bam, there it is. Well, that and about 800 uh -huh. other snakes. In the game, they land in an identical room, but the Ark isn't there, and you have to go all the way around through a book puzzle, some platforming, and the interior of a sphinx just to find it. Not to mention, for whatever reason, the map room that they had found in a completely different location is, for some reason, just off to the right inside of Tannis, which makes zero geographical sense. So once they have this extremely heavy arc, I guess they walked it all the way back to the starting room, Marion then gets thrown down, and the level finally gets a little bit more precise. They knock a statue over, end up in the catacombs, and then fight a giant snake. Never, never mind. This level really jumps the shark. Again, I love this level, but so far it is the most poorly adapted. Not just because of the different map room location, the larger Tannis, but also because of the random puzzles and the giant snake boss. I want to emphasize that a poorly adapted level does not mean a bad level, it's just poorly adapted. It also is worth noting that both the movie and the game feature different Star Wars hieroglyphic easter eggs, with the movie having various characters like R2 in the background on the walls, and the game having C-3PO, Princess Leia, and R2 above the Ark in the Ark Room. This scarcely makes up for anything else in the level, though. Drink water! It's a similar situation in level 5, but whereas previous levels added new locations without any film basis, the dig sites that you explore after immediately exiting Tannis are based off of some previous shots from the movie. You can see the minecart trails, the wooden stilts, the cranes, you name it. One other thing that I never noticed was that you're able to actually see the place that Indy and Marion exited Tannis from if you jump and pan your camera up, with the markings on the side of the bricks matching the movie too. After all of that, you infiltrate and sneak through a Nazi camp to make your way to the plane. You get to see and drive the locks car around even before the arc chase sequence, and there's various other military trucks that are visible inside the movie as well, scattered around. And then of course, there's the plane. While this scene lacks the German mechanic that Indy knocks out, it makes up for it by including the boxer's hut as an explorable location, even making it a part of a minikit puzzle. It doesn't entirely mirror the movie, as the hut originally didn't have any windows, and there wasn't a gramophone just sitting outside, but I still commend them for including it in any capacity. The fight, obviously, doesn't really follow the plot to a T, but you know, at least you can still stuff Marion in the plane and blow some stuff up, so that's, that's kinda cool. Nothing crazy happens in the arc chase, the trucks are accurate, I guess, but it's a little hard to deviate from just a straight car chase. The iconic surfing on the grate of the truck also doesn't happen, but that would have most likely been way too difficult for them to do on this engine anyways. Get it? Engine. A large portion of the film is then skipped over, as we go straight from the arc chase to the German U-boat dock, skipping the entire submarine scene. Can you imagine how cool it would have been to have a mini stealth scene with Indy dodging Nazi soldiers on the boat and then swimming over to the U-boat? Maybe a potential idea for a Lego Indiana Jones 3? Please? Regardless, as we spawn in, we see two neat details. Number one is the number 26 on the side of the U-boat, which matches the number from the movie, and in the background of this shot, the moving platform on the ceiling. As Indy enters the dock, we see multiple crates, including the Ark, being carted across the ceiling, which I guess the devs liked enough as a mechanic to put into the actual level, which I'm only just now noticing the connection there on my upteenth playthrough. In classic LIJ fashion, the second room of the level where you have to open the silver gate doesn't happen at any point during the movie, allowing us to skip ahead to Belloc's ceremony. This room is on par with Marion's bar in terms of accuracy, with every cliffside and object being so intentionally placed, it almost makes you wonder how they got this so perfect but couldn't bother including the whip scene. I digress. They even included the camera, which is barely in the shot for 10 seconds, as a minikit puzzle. It's genuinely amazing how well this level translated. Take a look at these golden lightning beams, they look identical to their LIJ2 counterpart. Someone in the office must have really liked this scene. And that's all for Raiders of the Lost Ark. Overall, it's a fairly accurate adaptation, with its only inaccuracies coming from the extra stuff it chooses to add to flesh out more underdeveloped areas of the levels. Now, would the film have benefited from taking things that were dedicated to cutscenes and using that to fill out the extra flesh? Flesh? Flesh. 
Now, would the game have benefited from taking things that were dedicated just to cutscenes to fill out those empty gaps? Sure, but if that was the case, we wouldn't have gotten the explorable underground city of Tanis, or that cool-looking cliffside in the end of the Lost Temple. It's hard to say if the game would have benefited from those changes, but I'm really happy with what we got. All of that leads us into Temple of Doom, by far the most divisive of the original three movies, and by far the least faithful of the three. This episode cuts more than it adds, and again, while some of these changes make the game more fun, the stuff that we lost out on is genuinely very disappointing this time around. Level 1 starts off pretty strong, with the only inaccuracies in the first room being the presence of a second gong and the miscoloring of both the piano and the balloons, but everything else checks out. It's when we get to room 2 where things take a turn for the worse. In the movie, the whole grand car chase takes place, more reminiscent of the second game than the first. LIJ-1 has you instead repairing Short Round's car and driving it to the escape plane, which is a much more tame retelling. None of the signs on the outside match up with ones found in the movie, and because the cars are constantly moving, it's hard to make out any specific details, rendering the second room pretty unfaithful. Not even the plane warehouse makes up for that, with the environment being much more flat than what we got in the film. The plane shouldn't be inside of a warehouse, and there should be way more commotion happening in the surrounding area. It's worth noting, too, that Indiana's outfit changes from the dinner suit to his classic fedora jacket look when he enters Short Round's car, when he should just be in the dinner suit the entire level. I still have no idea why they needed to change him back so soon, the character exists in the free play roster after all. Then we skip right past the emergency raft landing and the visit to the village to speed along in our journey to Pankot Palace. There is nothing more high-octane than escaping a, a crashing plane on an inflatable raft down a high-speed river, and instead we spend our time in the levels, guiding elephants to the entrance of the palace. Weirdly enough, the game also only gave us two elephants, while the movie has three, and we don't get any of the village guides that are also present in the film. This is strange to me, since the game has handled party sizes of four in other areas, and regardless, should there not be three elephants for three players? It's strange to see a LEGO game turn away from the opportunity to explore new abilities, and this was the perfect time. Why not give us village guides that have a special weapon or object to help clear the way, instead of the same high jump we get in nearly every level of every movie? There were a lot of chances for this level to do something unique, but it still remains one of, if not my least favorite level in the game. The setting doesn't really match up with the journey they take to the palace, and while there are a ton of snakes that block the way, there's not a whole lot more to say. It would have been a great chance to bring back the bats from Dagobah and the complete saga, but no, it's just a monotonous and a long first room. The second room starts a bit better, the decor in the room match the movie fairly well. I mean, it's a lot smaller, but it's not a huge deal. It just started raining outside as I was reading that line, and uh, that sound scared the sh out of me. Both Indy and Willie's rooms may look like they're on the wrong sides of the hallway, but because of this one median shot, we can see that it's only because the camera is on the opposite side of the building. Granted, the rooms themselves are pretty inaccurate, with the beds being against the wrong wall and tons of furniture being missing. At least they're the right color, though. Things deviate a bit more the further along we go. There's this whole added tunnel section, which while fitting the aesthetic of the source material, is just another way to pad out the level's length. Personally, I think the level is already on the longer side. This could have very easily followed the film and just entered straight into the trap room. There's no need for this extra filler content. Speaking of the trap room, the skeletons that fall down from the ceiling most likely parallel these skull indie uses to stop the gears in the film. It's a cool detail. In true Temple of Doom fashion, we then skip over like three just truly incredible scenes and very important plot elements as well. We skip over Indy stealing the stones, we skip over Indy and Short Round getting captured, and then we skip the torture scene, which, okay, yeah, I get it. We're not going to show Indy getting tortured, but this was the perfect place for an intermediate boss fight, unlike what happens next with the fight against Chatter Lal in 2-3. Before that, though, we have to do a completely unrelated first room. Full disclosure, I f*** with this level heavy. I love it casually, it's super fun, it's a great speedrun, and it's one of the most memorable levels in the game. But this adaptation is crazy weird. Again, the first room never happens, 
and I guess this was the replacement for Indian short round discovering the Elon Musk family minds, but even sequentially it makes no sense. I mean, they do show a child being drugged in this scene, so why can't they show Indy getting tortured? It's it's all just, it's all messed up. We do get a very accurate room too with the giant Kali statue, which reminds me a lot of 1-6. It feels straight from the movie. I mean, look at it. The ledges where you find the levers are in the movie, the doors where the thuggies exit from are in the movie. It's crazy how we have the most inconsistent and consistent areas so far in the same level. The only major inconsistency I could find throughout this room's map is the presence of the second gear on the left side of Kali, where there should only be just one found on the right. It's most likely there just for symmetry's sake. Now earlier, I complained about how much they skipped over, and for good reason there was a lot. But this fourth level, Free the Slaves, seems to try and rectify that, by taking elements found from before Willy's sacrifice in the movie, and working them into this segment of the game. Directly after Willy is released, Indy immediately fights the dude on the conveyor, but here, we have to work our way through the caves, freeing a bunch of the children, and eventually even Short Round. This might confuse fans of the movie, because at this point in the plot, Short Round shouldn't be captured. He escapes his capture before Willy's sacrifice, it's what breaks Indy out of his trance. In LEGO Indiana Jones, though, he's captured now. It's a very confusing change, one that messes with the sequencing of the movie more so than any other change thus far. Anyways, now only as Willy and Indy we run through the mines past all the stuff we saw previously until we reach the boss fight, which is surprisingly accurate compared to the rest of the level. Sure, the environment looks pretty similar, the wooden stilts in the background and scattered machinery do feel right from the movie, but the segment being so late into the game's plot made me question if I was getting Mandela affected when watching the film. I do enjoy how the boss fight works here, and yeah, the puzzles don't exactly match up, but I see the vision. Even the mechanic of the rock falling on the guy's head is the method used to beat him in the film. It's really creative. There is yet another case of an inaccurate outfit with the Maharaja, but it's been happening ever since Pankot Palace, so I'm just gonna choose to ignore it. Escape the Mines is by far the most unique level in the game, for better or for worse, and it somehow manages to be the most accurate level yet. Not only do specific track segments match up like the hill and the perilous lava lake, but we also have the big tubs of sand, the track switch motors, and the use of the shovel. Sure, the enemies are wielding swords instead of guns, but with how scarce they appear, I wouldn't consider that much of an issue. If they would have gone the route of taking down X amount of enemy carts instead of hitting X amount of switches, this would have easily been by far the most faithful level we've covered. Even the first room, where you have to physically push the minecart, feels straight out of the movie. Which brings us to Battle on the Bridge, the final level of Temple of Doom. Where do we begin? Look, they tried their best with the water running scene. Although the ground is missing the minecart track present in the movie, it's adapted fine. It does feel like the laziest part of the level, like a boulder chase with less jumping, but it works. The cliff sight at first glance looks sound, but despite the addition of a ton of new puzzles and platforms, they don't make use of a mechanic that was right in front of their face the whole time. Water... spouts. I, I don't know what else I'd call them. Imagine you're scaling the cliffside, and every level you progress upwards, the water destroys the one below you. This happens in the movie, and would have given the level a much more high-octane feel, which it could definitely use being the ultimate final level of the movie. The next room is a triple puzzle room, with you needing to use each of the character's special abilities to unlock a door. I prefer to just shove Short Round through it with a bush, but if you do choose to complete it, it's a solid way to show off what the party can do when they're all together even though, again, it has no basis in the source material. In the movie, they go straight to the bridge after exiting the cave. There is one intermediate scene where Indy runs into a bunch of the thuggy warriors, which I guess could be paralleled right here, in this room, but I'm not too sold on that idea yet. After yet another room that doesn't happen, we finally get to the bridge, where we fight the glitchiest boss fight in the game, cut the rope, and end up the movie. There isn't much I can say in regards to accuracy here. Mola Ram's hand attack is reminiscent of when he tries to rip Indy's heart out after the bridge has already collapsed, but again, it's a boss fight, so it's not going to be one-to-one. -one. The bridge looks similar, but it's pretty hard to mess that up. Overall, Temple of Doom was a shaky adaptation. The mismatched outfits, the plethora of new rooms with no basis from the source material, and of course the obvious sequence breaking, makes you really appreciate how intact Raiders was. Again, a bad adaptation does not mean a bad game. I quite like a lot of Temple of Doom, and I think outside of one or two instances, the level design is actually pretty good. But it remains to be seen if it is going to be our least accurate film yet. 
as we still have one more movie to go, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Crusade is by far the safest of the trilogy. When Temple of Doom was met with criticism over its heavier subject matter, less likable love interest, and more cultish nature, Lucas and Spielberg backpedaled to the classic Nazi-punching stories that made Raiders a success in the first place. While I do love Connery and Ford's natural father-son dynamic, I can't say I enjoy the movie more than Raiders. Raiders feels like a globe-trotting adventure, while Crusade feels much more set in stone, and it's because of this that I feel like it should be the easiest to adapt. Only time will tell. We are not starting in Venice, contrary to what you might think. Instead, we have a small level titled Young Indy to tackle first. I know I said I wasn't going to overanalyze cutscenes, but I do have to point out that the opening shot of this mountain is ripped straight from the movie. They do that a lot, I know, but it's still cool to me. Young Indy isn't a traditional level, so it's fairly quick. There's no mini kits or parcels to collect, letting them focus on the design of the story campaign instead, and it really shows how that focus translates into accuracy. Of course, there's no collapsing pillar platforming or key turning, but Indy climbing upwards out of the cave and stealing some horses is way more on brand than whatever the hell this was. The train has the staple giraffes and discolored tarp, and the inside has the snake cart and the lion cart, both very integral to Indy's character. In fact, while in story mode, Indy isn't afraid of snakes until this point in the level, jumping past them with ease in earlier sections. It would have been cool if this young Indy version you unlock after you beat the level also had this fear immunity, but unfortunately, much like the book Indy in 3-6, he doesn't. It's also worth noting that Indy isn't wearing a satchel in this scene, making this minifigure inaccurate, though I'm guessing this was added to differentiate between the two characters. The only thing missing from this level was the Rhino train car, and because young Indy is so short, it really would have helped flesh out the back half of the level, but regardless, I'm still very satisfied with this adaptation regardless. I said regardless twice there, that wasn't in the script. Now we skip over a large portion of the movie, much like a lot of my viewers skip over that subscribe button. You know what to do. Panama Hat's ship happens in LEGO Indy 2, Indy's meeting with Donovan is delegated to a cutscene, and Venice, well, Venice is here. In a much smaller form though, Indy, Elsa, and Brody spend a few minutes walking over the dock and accompanying bridges, where the game instead puts us on a fast track to the library. The scenery is on par with the movie, and when we eventually get the establishing shot of the library building, things once again look pretty similar. Sure, there's no gate blocking off the water, but the alley on the right side, the bridge you walk over, and all the canopies and tables are there. I still love how this innocuous background bridge became a centerpiece for this room's puzzle, even though in reality, on the left side, there's no open courtyard type area, it's just all houses. I think this room in particular hits the nail on the head when it comes to maintaining the truth of the source material, but adapting it into a much more robust level without losing that feel. It's kind of like a best of both worlds situation. In fact, this whole level screams best of both worlds. The library's biggest inconsistencies are minute details, like the spiral staircase being in the back left rather than in the middle. The iconic numbers that lie at the crux of this mystery are also not here, besides the giant X on the floor, obviously, and the bookcase plaques are developer keyboard mashing. I don't think there's any meaning to these, but uh, let me know if you think there is down below. I'm not an expert in art by any means, especially when it comes to religious art, so I can't tell if the stained glass window is based off of any real piece, but it definitely does not match the one found in the movie. But this goes for most religious murals in the game. This includes the one at the end of the movie behind the fake rails, it's just a mirrored texture. After crashing through the floor, we reach what I would consider to be the best adapted room in the whole game, the catacombs. Take a look around you. We've got the petroleum on the floor. We've got this archway decorated with skulls, which also becomes a mini kit puzzle. Coffins, rats, the breakable wall, more petroleum, more coffins. It's just amazing. I never even made the connection that this wall is this wall in the game. It, it blew my mind. Even the petroleum in the lake represents how deep it gets after the section with all the rats in the direct order of the movie. I don't know, maybe I'm just overselling it, but going from this to this is just a huge jump in quality, and it really gives me hope for the future of Crusade. The final room leaves a bit to be desired, the lack of the boat crushing scene, the empty waters, and overall boring boss fight make it unfun and unfaithful, but after what we just got, I'll take whatever slop they want to throw my way. This leads us directly into level 2, Castle Rescue, where despite there being some misplaced objects like the tapestry and missing fireplace in room 2, 
The other smaller details like the presence of the statues and this candlestick help make up for it. We even get a parallel to Indy and Elsa's early peek at the Nazi presence through the side room accessed in Freeplane. It's worth noting though that in the level's titular room where everything lights on fire, not much crosses over. Indy and his dad are not only on the wrong side of the table, but the decor throughout the room hardly matches what we find in the movie. This is a bit of a letdown, as this room is one of the most iconic in the entire series, and things don't get much better from here. The Nazi war room is completely off the mark, with the lights and the tables hardly matching up and this entire outside section is just meaningless filler. I do really like how you have to push the chair to activate the staircase at the very end of the level, but I'm pretty torn on the rest of it. At the very least though, this level feels like the last crusade, even the bits that weren't present in the movie, which is more than I can say for Temple of Doom. This trend continues with Motorcycle Escape, with an uber-accurate first room containing boats and motorcycle crates, and a very well-inspired second room, with the mud, checkpoints, and even the flagpole that Indy uses to joust all being present. Yeah, there is a ton of filler in this level, notably in Room 3 and the final room, which feel very arbitrarily placed and based off of nothing, but again, for what it's worth, it's amazing. Is it as much filler as, say, Into the Mountains? No, but it's still enough to pad out a short section of the film while not betraying what it stands for. This is where The Last Crusade really shines. It's the perfect blend between fun, inventive design, and faithfulness. Taking elements that may not be exact one-to-one -one replicas anymore and putting them into the game in a way that kind of makes you forget they weren't there in the first place. While this barely applies to the blimp, which has the lamp and the elevated side platform used for a mini kit, it does apply to everything afterwards. The farm area, the car rebuilding process, it's all new. Sure, there's scattered houses and buildings here and there, but it's how they took these background elements and turned them into puzzles that really surprised me. Of course, the car theft and the drive-by cutscene are both classic moments that had to be recreated, and the use of birds to take down the final plane is an ingenious reference. This ended up being one of my favorite levels to cover. This is in stark contrast to level 5, which was one of my least favorites to cover. Every room before you're on top of the tank isn't sourced from anywhere in the film. It's kind of cool that this inner cave foreshadows the Grail Temple with the lion statue, and I do overall love the look of it, but none of this really has any base. This also just so happens to be one of the worst levels in the game, and I would have loved more variation. Maybe the whole level could have taken place on top of the tank, and the platforming comes from dodging incoming gunfire or cliff sides, I, I don't know. But I would have taken anything over this, even the horses are the wrong color. But this finally brings us to our final level, the finale, the Temple of the Grail. While the outside geography matches up pretty well, this whole segment with the soldiers shouldn't take place until inside the temple, and it just so happens that there are no soldiers inside the temple. Kind of a mix up there. You do get the huge lion statues that were foreshadowed in level 5 making a return along with the Grail Knight engravings on the wall. This is all without mentioning the level's trial recreations and how they're amazing adaptations. We've got the circular saws in the same position as the movie, we've got the Hebrew spelling of Jesus, and even the optical illusion bridge. Which isn't actually an optical illusion, it's just a gradient fade. It's somewhat sad, but it still works. The big disparity here comes down to the level's size. This level is gigantic and very open, where the source material has it much more cramped and claustrophobic. This is best seen in the saw segment, where we get a large zoomed out camera as opposed to the tiny hallway Indy is stuck in. After all of that, and a bit of filler, we reach the inner sanctum, the final room. This room is, once again, much bigger than the film's counterpart, and there are some missing details such as the lack of silver platters and dishes alongside the grail cups, and the mural against the back wall that doesn't match the movie. But there's also some keen attention to detail like the Grail Knight's altar. And really, that's kind of it. Yeah, the Grail isn't found in the exact same place, but it does have the rough clay texture as opposed to the bejeweled and golden cups that surround it. I really like the Grail Knight's design, especially the chainmail print on the headpiece, and I think having him attack Indy is very out of character, but a fun wrench to throw into this segment, seeing as there really is no final boss fight to the movie. Overall, LEGO Indiana Jones is a game that takes and borrows inspirations from that source material, but gives more attention to detail to background elements than the forward-running geographical locations and shapes. With the exception of areas such as 1-6 or even 3-1. Does this make it a bad game? Absolutely not. It's one of TT Games' best games in my opinion. But does it make it a bad adaptation? Well, that's a bit of a more complicated question, 
and I'll leave that for you guys to discuss down below. Do you think that the levels of LEGO Indiana Jones 1 parallel the movie's events well, or do you see it as more of a separate interpretation? Let me know down below, but that's, that's all from me. I'll see you guys in a, a week or two. Thanks for watching. Like the video.